Hi guys, welcome back. This is Match Hat episode 263, featuring a review of the game Wasteland 2. Now, I'm sure you've heard about this game, unless you've been living under a radioactive rock all this time. It's really attracted a lot of attention, and yours truly had something to do with the game's development. Anyway, I will leave that to the rest of the video to explain. But anyway, this is a wonderful game. I've already managed to log over 64 hours into it, and it's a little over a month old. To give you some idea of my current addiction level. Anyway, it's fantastic stuff, and we've got a lot to cover, so without further ado... Here is Wasteland 2. And here we go, folks, with a game that I have really been looking forward to reviewing uh, ever since it came out. I've, I've played it through once. Definitely plan on playing it at least a few more times. I think this game will become one of those games I return to every few years, like Baldur's Gate and the Icewind Dale series, Neverwinter Nights, uh, Knights of the Old Republic. Just play it all the way through with a different set of characters, different set of skills, and just really enjoy it every time. It's... Uh, to my mind, uh, something of a modern masterpiece. And to tell you the truth, it's something that I would not have imagined was even possible five, six years ago. Somebody told me there would be a Wasteland 2. You know, I might have uh, believed it to be possible, but if, if, if somebody did it, it would be a Bethesda a Fallout, a quote unquote, reimagining. Basically, they turned it into a glorified first-person shooter, and it would basically lose everything about it that I enjoyed <laughs> about the original Wasteland. Uh, happy to say, uh, they, they uh, Brian Fargo and NXile, they've gone through the Kickstarter model, freed themselves from the uh, motives of a publisher that would try to force them into something like that. So basically, we've ended up with a, uh, what to call this, a... Reimagining seems kind of hokey. <laughs> Basically, just a sort of a the game they probably would have made back in 1988 if they'd had this kind of technology. Now, you fans of this show I would be pretty impressed to know that Matchet actually has something to do with this game. You know, if you go back and look at those interviews I did with Brian Fargo uh, back in the pre-Kickstarter era, you know, Matchet's been around uh, for about five years, I guess. Uh, but anyway, I, I asked him the question: What would Wasteland 2 have been like, you know, if you guys had made a Wasteland 2 instead of uh, launching that Fallout franchise. And uh, he thinks about it, and you can sort of see the light bulb go off in his head. And, uh, you know, when this Kickstarter model became feasible, I guess, or when people started to uh, look at this seriously, uh, they put Wasteland 2 up. Uh, Wasteland 2 was the first uh, game from this company that, of course, gone on to what they've got two or three in the in the pipeline now but it's really exciting they asked for 900,000 ended up with uh, close to 3 million uh, let's see what that I can get the exact figure yeah 2.9 million I think they also raised some more after the Kickstarter so so it's really proven that there's a demand for this style of game I'm really happy that they were able to make this and that he took the leap all right, so look at this. Uh, we're looking at the character creation screens now. If you want to just jump right in, you can pull in those pre-made characters, but I've always thought that was kind of lame. You know, half the fun for me is getting in here and messing around with stuff. Now, if this is your first playthrough, first time playing it, what I would suggest, don't even really worry about this. Just pick some stuff that looks interesting. Uh, just kind of create a junk party. I uh, play for a couple hours, get a feel for it, and then come back and, you know, then uh, put some more thought into the party. You know, that's what I did. Uh, but even after going through that twice, and this is, you know, like I said, I played through the whole game, uh, it's still difficult to put these characters together. I mean, there's lots of choices you have to make, and they're important choices. They'll make a difference in whether you'll be able to complete the game or not in some cases. Now, keep in mind, too, the uh, some of this is designed, I think, to encourage replay value. So you won't necessarily be able to master everything, you know, open up all the saves and repair all the toasters and uh, all the electrical devices and you know and pick every uh, lock and so on uh, so but that's okay you know maybe you can focus on save cracking your first playthrough get a character maxed out with that uh, maybe the next time you play you'll focus on those dialogue options and be able to you know do the hard ass kick ass and the, and the kiss ass options uh, you know each of those has to be maxed out pretty much by the end of the game to see some of those options so uh, don't try to, you know, take on the whole thing that is Wasteland 2, the first playthrough. Now, you notice there's lots of interesting options here for my personal information. you got the usual name, of course. Uh, but you also could put in an age, religion, 
and what kind of cigarettes they smoke and uh, their ethnicity and you can even uh, type in a biography uh, for the characters so that's kind of interesting now I don't know whether this is a you know a good or bad thing but most of this stuff has no bearing whatsoever on the gameplay and you know, the character except for the gender uh, that makes a difference but uh, the smoking and all the other stuff is just there for fun it's kind of a way for you to uh, put a little uh, creativity into the character development process you know see what you can come have a little fun with it for God's sake and that's what this is about but if you're in a hurry or you don't care you can just skip it you know it's up to you just a few things I will point out about this process though now, some of these stats if you just bump them up one notch it gives you a very nice perk for doing that like if you bump up the intelligence up a notch it'll give you an extra skill point every time you level and I think uh, bumping up strength will give you extra constitution basically more health every level you know that adds up a lot over the course of the game so it, you know everything is important uh, so to speak but those two in particular I would take a close look at now, as far as the weapon skills you definitely want to be thinking in terms of ranged characters and melee characters you know, people that are going to be close to the enemy and ones that are farther back now the ones that are further back you want to focus those guys on coordination uh, maybe a few points in uh, speed uh, perhaps uh, intelligence maybe I think luck controls the, the crit but it's basically going to be the coordination for those guys now the ones that will be up close uh, you need to have a lot more strength with those and perhaps also speed uh, the initiative is uh, pretty cool if you have a higher initiative in combat basically what that means is you'll be able to take your turn before the monsters sometimes you'll be able to kill two or three of them uh, before they even get to move if you have a high initiative so that that's a trump card <laughs> You know, because, uh, you know, just like, like most role-playing games, an, an enemy with one health point is still going to be able to do full damage against your party. And uh, sometimes they can actually kill one of your guys before you even get to move if you're really slow. So don't underestimate the power of the speed. Um, also, uh, you don't want to try to get two or three different kinds of weapons. But uh, there is an issue of ammo in the game. Uh, later on, it won't be a big deal or at least at the easier difficulty levels, but uh, you might struggle to have enough ammo for some of these weapons. You know, especially the submachine guns, you know, as, <laughs> as you would imagine, uh, rip through the ammo pretty quick. Um, on the other hand, I never had a shortage of shotgun shells or handgun uh, bullets, so you know, that might be something to, to think about. Most of the people I talk to about the game, and I would agree with this, uh, the energy weapons very good choice. You do a lot of damage with those. It doesn't matter if you're close or far away with them either. Uh, they can still hit. Uh, as you'll see, the range uh, can make a big difference. Uh, I'll get a, more into that later. The only really uh, skill on here that I consider to be pretty much useless, uh, the bartering, I wouldn't bother with that. You, know, you won't have a problem finding stuff to sell. Animal Whisperer is kind of debatable. You can do some pretty cool stuff with it. You can basically recruit little pet followers, and there's a couple of little quests where you can get a bonus for having that. Uh, but the only problem is the animals, you have no control over them, and they tend to die right away. <laughs> like, like right after you recruit one, it dies. Uh, so it's actually kind of sad. And the, you know, so I wouldn't bother with that if I were you, but, you know, if it's something you want to explore, go for it. Demolitions, critical. <laughs> Man, you end up, same thing with perception. There's just mines and traps everywhere in this game. You need some way to be able to detect them, hopefully diffuse them. And let's see, what else is... Alarm disarming, you could probably live without that. The hard ass, kiss ass, and uh, smart ass, those are basically just open up additional dialogue options. They tend to soak up a lot of your skill points too, so that's something you might, if you care about that kind of thing, uh, go for it. But otherwise, you might want to save your points. You can usually always battle your way through. The leadership option is kind of interesting. That has a couple of different roles, and it's tied. That's the uh, it's tied directly to that charisma attribute. Uh, the higher your charisma, the, the wider the range will be, and it, may, it gives all your characters within that range a a, a nice boost to their um, roles, so they can hit a lot better. And it also gives you a little bit finer control over the NPCs you'll meet, which is another whole dimension to the game. 
You're going to have lots of options for NPCs, you know, non-player characters, and they'll have their own personalities and agendas and also different sets of skills that will hopefully complement yours. And here, looks like we're finally through the character creation process, and I skipped a bit there, but you know, expect to spend some time. Now look at this lineup. A lot of these uh, folks worked on the uh, earlier game and uh, have worked with Brian Fargo on various projects. Notice uh, Matt Finley and uh, Chris Keenan. Uh, they did the Bards Tale 2004 reimagining. Look, there's Chris Avalon. Also a couple of folks from the original Wasteland, uh, Stackpole, Mike Stackpole and Liz uh, Danforth. Uh, they both worked on the original Wasteland. So it's a really nice team uh, they put together here. A lot of experience they brought to the table. What comes after the end? I don't know. Neither did they. They were just an army engineer battalion, constructing roads and bridges deep in the middle of the Arizona nowhere. They didn't know why Armageddon had come. They'd heard radio chatter about an attack on some space-based missile platform. But who had attacked it, or why? No one knew. What they did know is that the politicians and the generals had finally ended the world. Now, everything was gone. They took over a federal prison for a fort, kicked out the convicts, got busy starting from scratch. So as you can see, they have gone the eccentric route here and used a lot of full motion video for their intro. Now I actually uh, give this two thumbs up. I think they did an awesome job with it. You know, they've integrated some old stock footage from looks like some civil uh, service videos as well as some original footage. <laughs> Look at those cannibals there. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a lot better than the stuff we had back in the 90s. Oh, look at that dude. <laughs> yeah, my only regret is they didn't continue this. This is the only spot in the game where you see this uh, full motion video with the real actors and everything, uh, which uh, a disappointment to me. I would have pre much preferred it if, you know, at least between the chapter breaks or something, they would have had more of this. But I guess they had a limited budget. Now, I actually don't know. I'm, I'm kind of curious which one's more cost effective. You know, if doing this live action stuff is cheaper than just having CGI like all the other games do. But I actually prefer this. No Rangers. I know at times it seems our cause is hopeless. And I know it's hard to say goodbye to a brother in arms. But I want you to know something else. That no ranger who dies in the line of duty will ever be forgotten. Nor will he have ever died in vain or unavenged. Now you probably picked up on this unusual hybrid, I call it a hybrid form of sci-fi meets western. Lots of old school, classic western style themes here. I appreciate you coming to Captain Ace's retirement party when you hardly knew the man. Appropriate too, seeing as how investigating his death will be your first duty as a desert ranger. There's actually also quite a bit of you know, what I would call social criticism or cultural criticism going on here. Some pretty, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, for lack of a better word, political commentary that seems to be going on here. It's uh, not really all that subtle sometimes, but, you know, it's, uh, some of the themes, uh, you know, we're out here risking our lives, if not dying, to protect people who have very selfish, you know, very self-centered people, very narrow-minded who... <laughs> You know, don't, don't appreciate us at all, uh, but yet we still have to kind of carry this burden of being positive role models and you know trying to protect people's uh, rights, if not their lives, even if they don't appreciate them and are willing to side with the you know nearest available terrorist group. And it kind of makes you think about your own political views and you know to what extent you're willing to 
overlook evil, you know, for the sake of a little bit of, of additional security. You know, what rights are you willing to give up? And you know, there's also some religious commentary. <laughs> you know, there's not many sacred cows in this game, that's for sure. And here we are with these dialogue skills. And, you know, would it be too academic of me to call these rhetorical skills? <laughs> that's really what they are, right? You can try to intimidate somebody or suck up to them or try to intimidate them with your intelligence, I suppose. Smart ass. But it really is, I really enjoyed uh, reading all the text. I know it's it's quite a, quite overwhelming at times, it feels you. <laughs> it kind of takes you out of the game a bit to sit there and read a bunch of text, but none of it is, is, is poorly written. You know, if you just take the time to uh, to read it, I think you'll find a lot to appreciate there. So here's a little trick. So this uh, Mississippi Mule sh uh, sawed-off shotgun I got, really cool weapon, but it's only got one shot, and you have to reload, and that can eat up some of your action points. But you can actually equip two weapons, two different shotguns, and then just swap between them, so... Don't want to do that. So you can just swap and then use your other shotgun, save a few action points. So you'll pick up lots of little tricks like that along the way. So I'm just moving on into the wasteland. The rest of that is just exploring the Citadel area. You can recruit uh, one of the characters from the first game, Angel Death. She's very powerful, but uh, she'll only stick with your group for a while. So I learned that the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> first playthrough. Got real dependent on her, then she splits. But I loved you, Angel! Yeah, so you might not want to have her in the party. It's just kind of up to you. I wonder if the... You know, I actually don't know. But maybe you get more experience points if you don't have her. Alright, so this is the world map. And, you know, I was really surprised when I recorded this footage... If you notice at the bottom middle of the screen there, there's like a speed toggle and a view map and a pause. That must have been just added in the last patch because it was not there when I played it through. So it's pretty cool. It's good evidence that they are staying on top. People's concerns are patching this. You know, I did read some reports about people having bugs with the, some of the quests. Apparently uh, they couldn't complete some of the quests and so on. Uh, now, I, your mileage may vary. I personally didn't have any problems like that. I was able to get through the whole game. Now, the only weird thing, there was a kind of a strange glitch every now and then where I would lose control of the map. And like I couldn't move the screen around. I had to, uh, but it didn't freeze the game. All I had to do was save it and then reload it, and then it would work fine. Now that, who knows what that what that is? It could be something on my end, but you know, it did happen on more than one occasion. But fortunately, it was not a Game stopper and didn't crash, so very happy about that. So there's a good example of the kind of storytelling you can expect in the game. There's lots of uh, things you can observe, and if you pay attention and put the pieces together, they don't always spell out everything for you. So it pays to be observant, spend some time thinking about it. Don't just click, 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 click your way through. You know, put some thought into it, and you'll find there's lots of really cool stuff that uh, most people probably would just miss. So just, you know, take your time with this. So over here we notice there's a bronze star with the words Desert Ranger on it. So that obviously belonged to our uh, deceased ranger, the guy that they were putting into the ground there at the beginning. And gradually this story will start to come together. We'll learn about this, you know, much larger, uh, much larger movements going on. <laughs> And it's a pretty big story arc. I think they got a succession of story arcs here. And they're all, to me at least, interesting. So here's a good example of these dialogue options paying off. So I got two points in hard ass, so I can try to intimidate the guy. <laughs> You're insane! What the hell is wrong with you? Apparently I freaked him out pretty good, so they're not going to mess with me and I can just go about my business here without having to fight all these guys. I would have actually kind of liked to fight them, but, you know, I can still fight them anytime I want, but now I can do that on my terms, so. Just one of the examples of what you can do with your dialogue options. A 
let me tell you Matthias' law, friends. Matthias' law is vengeance. And soon, Matthias' law will stretch all the way to Arizona and kill those so-called upholders of justice, the Desert Rangers. That's another cool aspect of the game. That occasionally you'll pick up these radio transmissions and a lot of times you'll be hearing from these groups and you won't meet them till much later in the game, but thanks to those radio transmissions you'll already have a pretty good idea of the type of people they are and it'll arouse your curiosity and you keep thinking about what it's going to be like when you finally do meet them. <laughs> so lots of uh, ways to build up the tension there and fairly economically. You know, I think these guys have done a pretty good job of you know, they, they don't they're not wasting money on stupid assets. Like it probably didn't cost that much to record that that audio, but it's a, it's a nice touch. It really adds a lot of uh, interest to the game. A little cave I can go into here. So what am I almost 20 minutes into the game I've yet to fight anybody. Yeah, there's a toaster. <laughs> I'm you know, I'm not sure. I'm probably missing some huge you know, inside joke about the toasters. I don't know. But there are all these toasters around. If you repair them, you'll get some special items. You know, I did it the first time I, I, I had that skill, but I, I never did really get anything all that awesome from a toaster. And it's, just, it's such a specialized skill that I decided this time I wouldn't mess with it. You see, it's going to take at least two points to even get it started. Every now and then you'll find a statue like the statue of the cat. And it'll give all your characters a free skill point. But sometimes it's better just to save the point. You know, the, about the I could start a new skill if I wanted to, but it's not going to be all that useful. It's probably better just to save it. Try to level up something that I, I will need. And the higher up you level up a skill, of course, the more skill points it'll take to take it to the next level. So no harm in just saving it. So here, I believe, is the... We'll finally get into some combat here. There's all kinds of different critters and robots. Of course, human opponents to fight. I believe this first battle is with a... Yeah, there he is. Sort of a toad, frog-like thing. Might as well go over here and get these first aid kits. Okay, so when you want to initiate combat, you can just get next to the monster until it notices you. Or you can just get the first shot in like I did there. In some situations, you can actually uh, split up your party and get them all behind cover, then initiate combat. So yeah, that's pretty cool when that happens. Other sometimes though, you just kind of have to, you're forced to walk into an ambush. That always sucks. So you notice that uh, with these different kinds of weapons, there's a bar above them with the green uh, that green bar above the weapon shows you the ideal range of the weapon. The red dots indicate the enemies within range or how many enemies are within the ideal range. If it's green you're good. Now some of the weapons though they really suck if you're up close. Yeah here's a shotgun. So the shotgun has a cone which is awesome because you can target multiple enemies. The only downside is you can very easily hit your own people. <laughs> so that can be really tricky. This frog went down without too much trouble. Get some junk here. It's also a pretty nice inventory system. It's got an auto sort function. You can just sell all the junk you pick up uh, when you get to a dealer. So the inventory is not a big big deal. Of course, you do have a limited carrying capacity. Uh, that can be a, a bit of a problem later in the game when you have to keep going back and forth uh, to pick up more loot, sell it, go back, more loot, sell it. Of course, your stronger guys can carry more. Yeah, there's those uh, repeater units that I need. And we start to get the first inkling of uh, the bigger story going on here. The synths and the mechanical men. <laughs> Cyborgs, if you will. And I'm not going to spoil any of the story for you, but you know, it's introduced gradually and you get more and more pieces to it as you go along. There's a little bit later in the game, probably about an hour later, maybe an hour and a half. 
And basically, you got a choice of saving the people at High Pole or this other place called Ag Center. So that's another way to encourage replay value, I suppose. You can't do both. So first time I did the High Pole, this time I thought I would see what the Ag Center uh, was all about. As you can see, too, I've actually lost one of my characters I created. <laughs> he actually died in friendly fire. <laughs> so he died before I could even... You know, use my surgeon skills on him. So that is a possibility. And I guess you could try to complete the game with just three of your own characters and recruit some additional NPCs, but... You know, realistically, though, I probably would have just reloaded, but... You know, what the heck. He probably deserved it. So you can see I'm not really in a very ideal situation here. None of my guys are under cover. They're just all out in the open. And some of these weapons uh, are not at the right range. Now maybe somebody can explain to me how it could be easier to miss at point-blank range than it is when you're several hundred feet away. Now I guess we'll just have to chalk that one up to the mysteries of the game balance wizards. Anyway, it is annoying. You know, you have to miss you have to miss out on your action points to get enough distance where you can actually hit somebody. Now one nice thing though is that it really has a good cover system. So once you get behind cover, you'll automatically uh, duck down and get the evasion bonus. Of course, later on, the humans you fight will do the same thing. And you can waste quite a bit of ammo trying to shoot them. Also, if you get crowded with enemies, I guess it makes your characters nervous or something. And they'll start to fumble more. Just use a little healing item on myself. But it's pretty intense combat, even at this early stage. You know, it's very few combats in this game that will just be uh, routine, uh, you know, grinding sorts of affairs. Most of the time you will have to pay attention and you will be watching those dice rolls <laughs> with no small degree of anticipation. Ah, we splatted all the bugs and now we get to level up. Always an exciting time. All you have to do is call in and get our field promotion. Always an exciting time. We'll get some additional skill points that we can use, or save. Don't forget you can save your points, too, if you would prefer to wait until you get enough to raise one of your major skills. All right, so let's skip ahead a bit. I'll show you some of the antics my other party got into in Wasteland 2. So just like in the Fallout games, uh, sometimes you will just randomly encounter weird situations, like these are Wastelanders having a barbecue. Obviously, I gotta check that out. Big fan of barbecue. So these are just random encounters. You never know when you might have these and what it might entail. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've had days like that guy there over the spit. How about you? Kidnapped by Wastelander punks. Now, I've picked up this guy. This is an NPC, Lexcanium. And like his name suggests, he's got quite the lexicon. Lots of fun dialogue. He also packs a mean punch. You know, don't underestimate the power of brawling in this game. You know, this guy's fist weapons uh, do a lot more damage than... <laughs> old Ralphie here with his energy rifle. I don't even know why I bothered buying that guy ammo, to be honest. Yeah, machine gun's always good for close to 100 points of damage. Snipers are really cool, uh, especially if you can take advantage of their headshot. Now, I will say this. I do have some questions, you know, about the way these uh, rolls are handled. Because I notice on many, many occasions, I would have something like a 95 or even a 99% chance of hitting and just inexplicably miss time and time again. You know, with those kind of odds. Uh, I mean, I guess it is. <laughs> of course, it's random, so... There is always a one out of a uh, hundred, you know, one out of a hundred tries that I would miss anyway, but it just really seems to be skewed somehow. At least I felt like I was missing a lot more than I should. You know, you can see some of that here, but, you know, like I said, it would be 99% and I would miss three times in a row. So, you know, make it that what you will. Yeah, I love old Lexcanium here. He's just really awesome with these fist weapons. Just... I've, I've sometimes uh, killed three people in a row with him. 
But be that as it may, in a real life scenario, I'm going to be the guy behind the rock with a rifle. Not the guy in your face with a, <laughs> a glove with a claw on it. Oh, I love these death sequences. You know, every now and then you'll get the uh, really gruesome deaths. Kind of reminds me of that Fallout, original Fallout games where, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, the, what, what was the name of that uh, perk you could get in Fallout where you would always show you the really gruesome death sequences? <laughs> kind of morbid, but <laughs> uh, always fun, too. Now, you notice that shotgun is a spray gun, so I can hit two or three people at once. And you can get different kinds of mods on your shotgun, too, so you can have a narrow cone or a wider cone. So you can fine-tune that, depending on your play style. I'd have to say all around, the shotgun's a pretty damn awesome weapon, especially if you level that thing up enough and you get the uh, a good model. Sometimes you can kill two or three enemies in one round with one shot. <laughs> so Some of the shotguns you can actually shoot twice. So you can do a lot of damage that way. Yeah, I, I just don't know what's up with uh, Ralphie's energy weapon here. You know, I guess some, uh, maybe some creatures have more resistance to it than others, but, you know, everybody kept telling me to get energy weapons, get energy weapons. and He's just not doing uh, nearly as much damage as, as my other team. So don't know what's up with that. Anyway, nice chunk of experience points for that. Uh, <laughs> I guess it's a little late for this guy getting roasted. <laughs> you know, that, that's something else, man. I love the junk in this game. I mean, you're picking up random crap, but a lot of it is nostalgic references to the 80s and 90s. I mean, you're finding, like, Rubik's Cubes and old game consoles and not just Nintendos and Segas and stuff like that, but, like, the Vectrex... You know, just really cool, uh, you know, basically this is, this game is an homage to, like, 80s and 90s nerd culture. <laughs> I mean, you're going to find a lot of cool stuff. I thought I would wrap this up with a little tour of Hollywood post-apocalypse. As you can see, not much has changed. <laughs> just kidding. I've actually never been to Hollywood. It'd be pretty cool, though, uh, to see if it, how it compares to this. So, loving all these little random encounters. You know, again, you're never quite sure what you're going to run into in this game. <laughs> this guy, Rat Boy. You know, it's a lot of references to rats in this game. Very happy to see that. You know, I'd like to think I had something to do with it. <laughs> Lick and stick quarterly. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that magazine's about popsicles. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. I found uh, quite a few, uh, shall we say, adult novelty items. I mean, it's pretty risque. I don't know exactly what they get up to there at, in exile. <laughs> Maybe I don't even want to know. So there's a little taste of Wasteland 2. Obviously, there's a lot to this game I didn't cover, but hopefully this gives you a pretty good idea of what to expect from the game. And uh, whether it's something for you or not. Overall, though, I have no problem recommending this game. You know, some people, I, I guess, are trying to trash it in their reviews for whatever reason. But uh, yours truly found it very entertaining. I like, a, you know, it's just the little things, too, that, that make the difference. You know, for example, they have an option in here to speed up the combat. You know, a lot of turn-based games I've played... Now, they get boring after a while just because it takes so damn long for, like, these zombies to slowly lumber into position and swipe at you. <laughs> you know, you go back for a cup of coffee, come back, and, you know, the computer's still taking its turn. Well, you know, simple setting here, and you can triple the speed of the combat. So you can, you know, just skip over the parts you find boring and get right to the good stuff. And that's a you know, really good example there, I think, of listening to the fans and making a, a change. Maybe they didn't want to make, maybe they were really proud of their <laughs> zombie animation, but, you know, they, they catered to the fans instead of their their own little uh, whims. So, all in all, I really enjoyed this game and highly recommend it. If you like uh, the early Fallout games and games like XCOM or maybe even that <laughs> new Fallout games or the and the original Wasteland, if you're any of those categories, uh, definitely check this out. I think you'll enjoy it. And 
that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with a new interview series. I'm going to keep the guest a mystery for the moment, but I think you will really enjoy <laughs> uh, this interview series, particularly if you are a fan of the classic dungeon crawling genre. So stay tuned for that. I know you guys will enjoy it. As always, I want to thank you very, very, very much if you have supported me, my efforts to uh, preserve video games history and as well as review games like Wasteland 2. If you would like to support the show, actually, uh, one of the best ways right now is simply to buy Wasteland 2 using the GOG affiliate link in the show notes. Now, this will get you a copy of Wasteland 2 at no extra cost whatsoever, but Bat Chat will receive a small portion <laughs> of, the, uh, of the cost of the game. So it's a really cool system. And, you know, how can you go wrong with that? Uh, GOG's a great company anyway, and they're worth supporting uh, in and of themselves. So just look for the link in the show notes. If you don't already have Wasteland 2, uh, please consider buying it from GOG. Or, of course, you can uh, subscribe uh, on YouTube or uh, on Patreon. Uh, remember, you can support the show at any financial level that you feel comfortable with, and whatever you think the show is worth. You know, $1 per episode, $5 per episode, whatever works. I really appreciate it. Plus, that'll get you access to all kinds of bonus material. Uh, we just recorded a, a whole bonus interview uh, with uh, Jane Jensen of the Gabriel Knight series. So only available to the Patreon supporters. So uh, something to think about if you are on the fence about supporting the show. All right, what about news from the Matt Cave? Oh, man, lots of stuff. Uh, one of the things that's definitely caught my eye is that the uh, Civilization Beyond Earth game has landed, apparently to mixed reviews. Now, I haven't read these reviews yet, just looked at the score, and I haven't played the game yet, but I love Civilization 5 and 4 and 3, <laughs> actually all of them, uh, so much that I'm, I feel almost uh, obligated to buy the game, but I'd like to hear your thoughts if you're already playing it. Uh, you know, let me know what you think. If you... I think it's a worthy successor. Maybe I should just skip it. Keep playing Civ 5. You know, let me know your thoughts. Really appreciate that. Um, also, uh, The Legend of Grimrock 2, uh, that, I think that hit maybe last week. And I have uh, recorded an interview with the developer of that game. And I hope to have that on soon. Um, Shadowgate has uh, been out for a while, but they have just mailed out their boxes. And here it is, the Shadowgate box. And inside here is a disc, of course, and a lovely cloth map. It's actually one of the better cloth maps I've received, so very well done, and sure to be useful if you are a fan of the uh, Shadowgate series. You know, I don't know if you guys have been playing the remake, but, uh, you know, I played through the original a couple times, and it's definitely different enough that I'm once again stuck. <laughs> you know, so... Uh, you know, you Shadowgate fans, let me know what you think of the remake. Uh, also, there's a new Nancy Drew game out, Labyrinth of Lies. I know a lot of you guys probably aren't interested in the Nancy Drew franchise, but uh, nevertheless, if you like adventure games, or if you have a, a daughter, or perhaps a wife, or a girlfriend that you would like to play games with, you know, give this, give this a go. You know, my wife doesn't play hardly any computer games, but she really uh, gets into the Nancy Drew series. And, you know, it's, it's hard to beat playing games with your loved ones, so... You know, you know, give that a look. Okay, what else do we have here? I think that's it for the news. All right, so what about that ale of the week? Well, this week I have a very special ale selection. It was actually sent in uh, by one of the viewers of Mad Chat, uh, namely Christian Hallstrand, uh, by way of Tor Ivroth. He says, greetings, Matt. Here are some additions to your Ale of the Week collection from Christian Holstrand. The APA is new for this year, and we thought you should try it out. All the best, Tor Ivroth, Ale's courtesy of Christian. Well, they sent me three beers, and uh, just so happened the first one I grabbed was not the APA, but rather the uh, Lufsta Blonde Belgisk Ale. Uh, this one has 6% alcohol by volume. It is, uh, by the way, brewed by the Starkoll Brewery out of Sweden, unless I am very, very sadly and embarrassingly mistaken. Unfortunately, I cannot read anything else on the bottle. <laughs> it is uh, all in Swedish, at least I am hoping that is Swedish, otherwise I will look like an idiot. 
Anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so here I am with some Louf Stablon here in the rather excellent drinking horn. I've been uh, smelling it, and I have to say, I really like the way this ale smells. I mean, they've totally nailed that Belgian aroma. You get that floral bouquet. It literally smells like a bouquet of flowers, I mean, roses and lilacs and lilies and all that. I just sort of thrust into your face. Uh, this smells great. Uh, I love the way these Belgian styles smell. Anyway, let's give it a taste. Well, you definitely get some Belgian flavor to this, but there's kind of another taste going on there. I can't quite identify. Let me try it one more time. Not quite sure what I'm tasting there, but it's got kind of an unusual flavor to it, but uh, you definitely taste those sort of classic Belgian flavors that I always describe it kind of as a peachy flavor, kind of peaches and raisins uh, with a little bit of a, uh, like a bread, you know, fresh uh, a sweet roll kind of flavor to it. Uh, very delicious. Let me try it one more time here. Yeah, really nice flavor on this. It's, it's uh, thick, but not too thick. Very uh, refreshing. Um, you don't taste any alcohol at all uh, with this. Instead, you just get that really nice uh, Belgian flavor. There is another sort of uh, flavor to it. It's not bad. I just cannot place it to save my life, but uh, there's a little more going on here than with the uh, typical Belgian. Anyway, I really enjoy this. Uh, definitely no problems giving this a full uh, five out of five drinking horns. <laughs> uh, I highly recommend it, although good luck finding it. I've never seen it before. Uh, except from these guys. Uh, so thank you very much, Christian and Tor, uh, for sending this in. Really appreciate it and really enjoy the ale. All right, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And uh, I was looking for quotations about the wasteland. <laughs> and a big surprise came across some great quotes from T.S. Eliot. And I really thought this quote was perfect. It goes something like this. Only those who will risk going too far can possibly find out how far one can go. See you guys next week. Please, everybody, now where's my map? Come on, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> God, it's a barren, featureless desert out there, isn't it? <laughs> the other side, sir.